Hello, welcome to the show. This is Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm your host, Nikki Eisenhower, life coach and psychotherapist. And on today's episode, I'm discussing the toll of the polls, the toll that American politics has on our mental health. Hello, y'all. I'm sure some of you are cautious hearing me share this title. I want to preface this episode getting any assumptions out of the way. I think as you go into this episode, you will see why I don't find assumptions useful, helpful, or towards positive mental health and relationship with self. I want you to know that I did not vote for Trump and I did not vote for Kamala. Let's get into it. I love you if you voted for Kamala. I love you if you voted for Trump. I love you if you voted independent. I love you if you didn't vote. Also, I'm tired. Maybe you're here because you've been with me all along my podcast journey. Maybe you're newly here because someone shared emotional badass with you who loves and cares about you. Maybe you're here because some of my narcissistic abuse recovery content has gone viral and found you and brought you all the way here to the show. I'm tired because it's two days after our American election, 2024, Harris versus Trump, and Trump has won. I wanna talk about a philosophy that I talk about a lot on the show. It's a guiding principle to my life. It's Buddhist non-attachment. But I wanna start with me sharing something that I wrote on a thought leader social media shortly after the election. I'm not going to name any names, but some of you may know, based on what I say, who this is and what group this is. I said, there's a little click, a click of authors, therapists, speakers, spiritual advisors. I wish I would have added entertainers too, but I didn't. A little click who have taken it upon themselves to tell people how to vote to attach to outcomes they can't control. That fear is smart or proof of caring. It's wrong. It feels like high school. Thought leaders should guide not people pleasing or doing the popular thing just because it's popularized. Thought leaders should teach people how to think, not what to think or what to do. That's control. It makes people your sheep instead of their own lion. Why can't you and your clique do this hard thing? Are you bought? Is it a Hollywood adjacent thing? Is it a drama addiction? Is it the fear of being disliked? What is this misalignment? I'm in a similar space and work with people across the political spectrum. I'd feel biased if I didn't truly hold space for all. How do thought leaders like you justify telling people who to vote for, even as a suggestion, and then having a business model that plays into trauma bonding together over the upset when your chosen leader loses? How is this healthy, evolved, or wise? I have lost a lot of respect for many people whose books and wisdom has sat on my shelves and in my mind, and in my heart for many, many years. It's been a long journey of respect losing, to be honest, starting with how many thought leaders also took it upon themselves to peer pressure vaccination. Feel free if you're new to me and learning about me and trying to figure out if I'm someone trustworthy or smart enough for you to learn and grow from and with. Go find my COVID episode where I explain that I don't put new, unproven medications or medical products into my body. And to this day, I remain unvaccinated for COVID, a decision I made after having a Gardasil vaccine injury, which I should not have to say aloud to have understanding and compassion for this decision to not put a brand new rushed vaccine into my body. Also check out my abortion episode. You'll notice a strong pattern in my teaching, in my sharing, that you are your own authority figure. 
because you are ultimately responsible for yourself and all consequences, positive and negative, from your decision making and from the random chaos of life. You will never catch me telling you what to do and you will find me validating that you have options. You always have options and you get to explore them free and clear as a principle for life. I respect any decision anyone makes when it is well thought out and considered. Notice I did not say perfectly thought out or perfectly considered because perfection is not available. It's not on the table. Please remember to find Emotional Badass wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to hit that follow or subscribe button so you never miss a thing. It really helps us grow. So thank you so much for hitting that button. Buddhist non-attachment is a principle. It's a philosophy. It's not a religion. Basically, it teaches the wisdom of letting go, of non-attachment to things, non-attachment to relationships, circumstances, ideas, emotion, thoughts, and so on. This is toward cultivating inner peace which is really truly all we can ever really control. This philosophy is towards building a quiet mind, a grounded energy. The idea is that the pain is not coming from, let's say, not getting an ice cream cone. The pain is from the attachment to the creation of the expectation and the idea of getting that ice cream cone. If we're practicing non-attachment and we show up and the ice cream shop is closed, We move on with ease. We detach from the concept of that ice cream cone. What attachment offers us is stress. It starts to lead us down a path of, but damn it, I wanted an ice cream cone. This place should be open right now. Why is it closed? It creates a fight with the reality of me not getting what I expected and what I wanted. Then we easily feel our egos attaching. I should be able to get an ice cream when I want it. We can hear the entitlement building there in our egos. A frustration built, an aggravation. We become more and more like a toddler about to throw a tantrum because we couldn't get the thing that we wanted. Of course, it's normal to have disappointment when we have an expectation and it doesn't come to fruition. That's why this principle is so important. What do we do with that? How do we leave that frustration, that disappointment, that sadness, that aggravation? Do we just stay there? What do we do if we don't have a strategy about how to take care of ourselves through non-attachment when we find ourselves attached? Then we just stay attached to our pain if we don't understand this concept. Then we feel more and more righteous as our ego keeps milking that attachment wound. So many people don't even know of this idea of non-attachment. And non-attachment or detaching in our Western societies, our, our worlds that have taught us so much attachment, maybe as a byproduct of so much attachment wounding across our culture, I can say more about that in another episode. Non-attachment is for our own good. It's for our peace. It's a peace strategy that we can enact any time we aren't getting the thing we think is right or we aren't getting the thing that we want right now. We're highly sensitive people. We're observers. As observers, we observe a lot. We could attach to a lot. We have to let go of so much as observers to be able to live, which means to be able to flow, to have more peace and more joy in our lives. Somehow, somewhere, it seems to me as if our American or Western culture decided that they, we were not going to embrace this Buddhist wisdom. Oh, no. We would actually do the opposite. It's as if our culture has been giving us steady doses of an attachment message that winds up sounding something like this. 
oh, you're a sensitive, caring person? Let me tell you, you better attach. You better attach, attach, attach. If you're really a caring person, you will be attached. You will be attached to fear in all the ways at all time. You will create and attach to ideas of worst case scenario. You will encourage fear. You will hold it. You will pet it. You will nurture it. You will call it wisdom. Attached to these ideas and detach from anyone who does not also attach to these ideas. This attachment is what being a good person is. You prove how much you care by how much you attach. Definitely attach to what is so big and too outside of your control for you to affect. The only detachment or non-attachment this Western philosophy seems to offer is an, an encouragement to detach from people with different ideas, maybe different priorities. Maybe a different thought process, a different vision, a different perspective. There's a lot of othering going on. It's as if this dysfunctional philosophy that has infiltrated our Western ideas says, hey, 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 don't you ever other me. It is so wrong for you to other me. But I will other anyone who doesn't think like I do. And who doesn't believe the very good things that I believe, which makes them bad and wrong. You aren't like me. You are an other. And I can treat you like less than a person because of that othering. Don't you dare do it to me. But I'm allowed to do it to you. As a moral stance. There's encouragement all over the internet. For people on the left to go no contact. With people on the right instead of detaching from their stress, detaching from their worst case scenario stressing. We're attaching as a culture to what won't serve us and it won't serve anyone. And we are detaching from what does serve us, what can serve us, like discussion, debate, answering questions with more depth, also letting go, getting grounded, no matter what we expected or what we attached to wanting. We wonder why young people are screaming and crying online, why colleges are creating safe spaces for them to come emote, encouraging each other to be petty, cold, cruel punishing to the more than half of Americans who voted for Trump. This is in large part, in my opinion, why Trump won. The Democrats have othered the other side, called them stupid, insulted, shamed them, labeled them horrible. There's no compassion in this. There's no maturity in this. And most importantly, there's no inspiration in this. There's only division in this. Democracy has problems because the way it works is majority rule. That means when you're not the majority, you lose. Democracy works as it is supposed to work. Do you want to get hundreds of hours of exclusive audio and video not available anywhere else and also help support my work and the show? Find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash emotional badass. You'll get monthly bonus episodes not available publicly, access to my monthly live stream, video Q&As, exclusive discounts, and access to our community of emotional badasses. Patreon.com slash emotional badass to join. Watching Democrats want to control the internet and social media out of this loss is another reason Trump won. It scares people who want the freedom to speak. I am someone who publicly speaks about outing the secret of childhood sexual abuse. I publicly talk about, I think, the worst word anybody could say because it makes us feel so icky, incest. And yet because of politics, I have often been stressed and scared to get on this microphone and speak the kind of wisdom and peacemaking that I know helps nervous systems integrate, 
calm down and ground so that we can do the very best thinking to make hard decisions through wisdom instead of fear and pain. The democratic side, if that side doesn't seriously humble themselves and reflect on why they lost, if they don't stop blaming, shaming, and making excuses that shirk their responsibility, they will not evolve past this. I was such a proud young Democrat as a young voter. This makes me so sad to see these changes over these last few decades. This is just like our individual and healing work, y'all. No individual and no entity heals unless he or she or it takes on being willing to reflect on the mistakes made on the journey. We have to be willing, if we are to be in integrity, maturity, honesty, we must be willing to learn new coping strategies that work better. Y'all are not going to like hearing this from me, but Trump seems to me to have taken coaching this time. He's softer. He seems to have taken guidance and coaching to be more presidential, to be less bombastic, to be more uniting. If I'm honest with you, these things indicate an absence of narcissism. The most narcissistic moment I witnessed in all of this election came from Kamala being asked what she would do differently than Biden on, on The View. And then Anderson Cooper gave her an opportunity to answer if she's learned from a mistake in her life. The woman couldn't answer. That flies a narcissistic red flag for me. Narcissists do not admit mistakes because to do so means that they were once wrong. Narcissism's essence is I am godlike and I do no wrong. And that is what she displayed when she showed that she both would not or could not humbly answer these questions. These are more reasons why Trump won. How did this happen is the question that I see online the most and the question I've heard the most from people in person. This is my answer. This is why Trump won. And this is why Kamala lost. But I suspect the very people repeating this question aren't really asking a question. It hits more so as a veiled commentary on the stupidity of the other side, the ridiculousness of the other side. This is the very same mentality continuing that elected Trump. Your efforts are backfiring. This is an opportunity to learn and pivot or to fail. To directly or indirectly insult people is the opposite of inspiring them to your cause. Democrats learn this or the party may truly be dead. It may already be dead. It may be already decomposing. Growth work takes courage, honesty, and a willingness to mature itself. It's hard, humbling work. It's why most people and most entities don't do it. Be the change you want to see. This is Gandhi's most famous quote. Keep blaming and shaming and acting flabbergasted and the party dies. How does that serve you? How does that serve anyone? I am most proud to have heard this from multiple people the weeks leading up to the election. I heard this from people in my personal world and in my professional world. Nikki, I don't know who you're voting for but I know you are a safe person for me to tell you whoever I'm voting for. I was so proud to hear this because it means that I am truly unbiased and it means that I'm truly holding space for people's growth and that I'm grounded and mature enough in my relationships with others for them to have a trust that I will meet them with an adult maturity without shaming or blaming them 
even if and when we find differences amongst us. Whether you are a thought leader with a platform or a person in your own smaller day-to-day real-life community, if people cannot say their truth to you, if they cannot say this about you that you are safe to share honest thoughts and ideas with, you are likely a propagandist, a propagandist in output or input or both. And today that can happen even if you're you know, avoiding the news, if you're avoiding online, because so many people are internalizing propaganda from all sides and then sharing it, passing it around like a true contagion. I have that perspective because I hear multiple people, because I work with so many people in a week and in a month, That these ideas are not organically coming from the individual minds. When multiple people say the same thing to me using the same language, that's a picked up propaganda. If you are a propagandist, my challenge and where I will put my foot down is that I don't believe you're a thought leader. You might have enough wisdom, enough tricks up your sleeve and tools, things that sound really wise, to draw people to you, to help people on the one hand, but then you're hurting them even if you don't understand it or know it from the other. Yes, we can do hard things. We can learn how to be unbiased. We can learn that we all have blind spots and we have to look for the blind spots. Would you get in a car with me if I said, my car has no blind spots and it's the same car you always drive around? We need to be able to see our blind spots. That may be the true safety, security, and prevention that we get to have as it relates to politics. We don't know what's real in politics. We don't know what's manipulated But we all do know that most certainly 100% is not honest, forthright, and we do not know and will never know what strings are being pulled in governments behind the scenes. We can do hard things like honor those realities better, more fully. I don't respect or listen to thought leaders who have made themselves propagandists and told their audiences what to do or even suggested which side to vote for. If you are a political commentator on either side, do your thing. You are offering some truth in advertising as a leftist commentator or a right-leaning one. Thought leaders blurring this line into political activism and telling people this is psychologically or spiritually wise or evolved or right is very, very wrong in my book. To me, this is what is politically dangerous. And I think the scariest people on the planet are people just smart enough to know what they know and be charismatic about it, but are maybe not smart enough to recognize their own blind spots, the way they're influenced, their biases, the way their fears influence their delivery of messaging. And when it comes to women, what I will call a subtle control and a queen being is part of how women have related to each other since we were in grade school, y'all. We cannot pretend that as adults, this isn't happening. This feels no different to me than middle school mean girl cliques with a queen bee that dominates the other gals and decides what the group is going to do. Those mean girls often smile right at us saying, oh, honey, I'm doing this for your own good. Let me dress you for the dance. Don't go with what you want to wear. It both sounds and feels helpful. And at the same time, it feels icky. It feels like I'm not allowed to think my own thoughts. I'm not allowed to do my own thing. I'm going to get rejected if I go against the queen bee. I might not have a social group if I stand up for myself or do my own thinking or my own doing. We have to understand as grown women in particular, 
Are we the people that go along with anything that feels queen bee-ish? Or are we not to? When we don't go along with the queen bee, we learned it in elementary school. We're left out. We're made an outsider. We're othered. We're left alone at best and bullied, shamed at worst. Again, these dynamics are part of what elected Trump. How can anyone argue with me or push back on this idea when we literally have people all over social media encouraging going no contact with Republicans? What will you attach to or detach from? I don't mean in general as much as I mean right now, today. You know in your intuitive gut that attaching to this upset or drama is icky. It's icky for your body. It's icky for your mind. It's icky for your energy, your outlook, your present day, and your present moment. Will you be brave enough to not follow the crowd and actually take care of your mind and your body and be an example in the world of maturity, kindness, compassion? Don't just be compassionate when you win, y'all. Cultivate compassion when you lose. And the benefit to you will be a massive decrease in anxiety and stress. A surge in groundedness and peace. Why? Because your inner child is always watching. And he or she is very frightened and depressed when she watches you Listen to or be the mean girl. And I mean that if you're female, I mean that if you're male. I think it's part of our culture now. Your inner child feels safest when you are in your maturity, when the adult is at the helm, when you are honest, when you are growing, when you are being respectful and mature. That's when you honor your highest self instead of giving into our lowest, easiest angriest, most hurt human frequencies and vibrations because we didn't get our way and we aren't worshiping spoon-fed fear. Just like when we were young and in school, I would tell any child, be wary of what the popular kids are doing and stay true to yourself. Be wary of that queen bee energy. Stay true to your highest vibration, coming back to it again and again and again and again. Modern life, like a sneaky little devil, y'all, keeps inviting us to stress, to chaos, to division, to hate, to anger, to hurt, to fear. Resist as a radical act of rebellion. I love you if you voted for Kamala. I love you if you voted for Trump. I love you if you voted independent, and I love you if you chose not to vote. You always get to make your decisions. No one else is living your life. Hold on to that for you. But I want to encourage, let's hold on to that for each other too. When we do, this division will go away. And we will, once again, be the United States of America. We've acted in a lot of ways like the parent of the world, haven't we? Let's take our inner children away from the helm away from the wheel. And let's step forward with a grounded maturity and detach from what no longer or never did serve us. Take care of yourself and each other, everything that that means. And do not allow yourself to be a pawn for propaganda or stress strings pulled. Cut those strings. This is how we stop surviving and we thrive. If you want to continue to cultivate an inner peace and a maturity that helps you never again feel like an imposter adult and helps you have more confidence, just keep following along. If you feel inspired, come join one of the other things that I offer. A course, the Patreon, a workshop. Just marinate in what I have to offer. Healing, growth, maturing. It, it's like learning a, a new language. We do best when we marinate in it and it starts to become who we are instead of just a thing we're trying to learn. Light, love, 
and respect. I'm an emotional badass. You are an emotional badass. And together, we are where Moxie meets mindful. Light and love. And I'll see you right here next time for a brand new episode. Till then, take care. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.